Good well, afternoon, well. everyone. Uh, we will uh, get started. It's 2.01. Uh, my name is Michael Kobuz. And I'm Tina. And we are Cerulean Arts. So we welcome you to, the, to today's uh, tour and talk of the latest Cerulean Arts Collective exhibition featuring the work of Marguerite Heilman, Tilda Mann, Amanda Mosley, Stephanie Rogers, and Ruth Wool. So first we are going to uh, tour the exhibitions. So Tina's gonna walk through with her uh, phone and uh, each artist will uh, speak about their, their work. So I ask that you please stay muted during the tour. And uh, after we finish, we will open up the breakout rooms and uh, then you can ask, uh, you know, your questions and, and converse with, with uh, everybody. And uh, just to let you know that the gallery is open. Uh, we're open Wednesday through Friday, 10 to 6, Saturday, Sunday, 12 to 6. So we encourage you to come down and see the work in person if you're able. If not, you can see everything online. Uh, so I'll put a link to the show in the chat right now. So you can see everything there and you can also buy online, which is a nice, uh, nice feature. Um, you should know that we are recording the uh, tour and talk. Um, and we will post it on our YouTube channel in the next uh, day or so. So now, did I get everything? Is that it? Okay. So I'm going to... Uh, spotlight the Cerulean Arts video so we can start start the tour. And the first uh, artist we're going to visit with today is Marguerite Heilman. Hello, Marguerite. Hello, Michael. How are you? Fine. Yourself? I'm very well, thank you. So I want to say good afternoon to everybody and thank you for joining us today. Um, and thanks to Mike and Tina for making this all possible. Um, I'm calling this exhibition The Substance of Paint. I could also call it what I did during the pandemic when I couldn't go to my favorite places to paint. Um, so it is a bit of a departure from my past exhibitions, which have been uh, plein air landscapes. But when you think about um, what you're doing with your painting, it's very much about the substance of paint and what you can do with it. So the, the collection really consists of four mini series that explore different characteristics of paint. This one would belong to the texture series. So you can see it really has a very articulated surface with um, where you can see the fluidity of paint, the, the volume of paint. Um, the first one we saw, the blue one, was part of the transparency series where I'm layering different colors over each other or different layers of the same color to get different effects. Um, moving into the exhibition, this first wall, the three on the first wall belong to a mini series that I'm calling Viscosity. And um, um, basically what I was doing was playing with acrylic and water at, to get different consistencies of the acrylic and then dropping in alcohol ink. And sometimes I would just spray it with alcohol, sometimes I would use alcohol ink. Um, so this was really an experiment in how to control something that seems somewhat uncontrollable, which is the reaction of the way the alcohol um, you know, affects the acrylic. So the, the challenge in this, and this is an example of one where I was working to really manage the, the final image rather than just let it be an accident. So in some cases, I actually went into some of those smaller spots and painted in other colors in order to get the final composition the way I liked it. So this next wall is the two of these, the red and the blue are dealing with the concept of transparency, where um, particularly on the blue one, Tina, if you come in close so that you can concentrate on it, um, well, or, and to some extent with the red one, where you don't have distractions around you, you start to 
get lost in this very rich world of textures um, that are created by the different layers of color. Um, in this one, I was playing with putting acrylic down and scraping it off with a palette knife or spraying it with water and then wiping it with a brush, which would pull, lift some of it, all contributing to these different intensities of color. Um, this is the same thing where I was, I was playing a lot with a spray bottle and, and creating these, these, it, it started to me, it started to look to me like underwater, um, underwater view of the tentacles of, of um, jellyfish, the way the streams of water worked um, over the top of the, yeah, with the, the colors underneath. Um, this one is, belongs to the mini series that I'm labeling texture. And I was working with fluid acrylic, which has very little texture. So I was putting in additives, different pastes or different gels, um, pumice in some cases. This one had a very, uh, the, the additive had a very sandy texture. So it was, it was uh, fun to put it down and then scrape it up with, with a palette knife. And in some cases go after it with a spray bottle to really open up some of the, the underneath color spots. Um, now on this wall, we're moving, these four belong to the viscosity series, which I've already discussed. Some of these though, I, I started doing an underpainting on the panel that I would then build the alcohol ink uh, texture over the top of. Um, and for those, I was discovering flash paint is a fabulous underpainting uh, medium because you can paint over anything and you can paint anything over it. Um, so the blue one that Tina's focusing on now belongs to what I, the series, the fourth series I called the optical series. And in that series, I really am playing with the optical effects that you get from color. Um, and was particularly interested in the juxtaposition of complements, blues next to oranges. Um, and you'll see in some of the later pieces, some of the optical, really rich optical effects you can get with this. But um, that one could almost belong to the transparency series. It's sort of a crossover. Um, these, the red, the blue, and the yellow in the upper corners are, belong to the texture series. And this red and green one is more of optical, but this one, you can see the, um, the rich textures. And having been a landscape painter, I worked in oil with palette knife, being able to get expressive marks was something that was important to me. This one is playing with matte versus gloss finish. And this is bringing in some of the concepts of transparency where I'm laying washy layers over colors underneath to see how that affects the overall surface. And this one is both transparency as well as a little bit of the optics where I'm dealing with reds and greens. Margaret, who are your uh, ancestors that you're referencing here? I was reading your artist statement a little bit about like what the context of these. Well, it was interesting, you know, 2020 was also the year of the binge, you know, where people were binging on, on TV series like Outlander. And I admit I did that, but I also ended up binging on audiobooks, and I was, I would go into the studio and I would be playing in the studio while listening to the, the audio book of Ninth Street Women. So I found myself very immersed in the, 40s and 50s and 60s in New York. And this, this group, the optical group, I realized was, was it, it actually, I went in and started examining more about Poons and the other op artists of the 60s to understand what they were doing. And one of the hallmarks of their work was that it needs, you need to work with very flat paint, very intense color, and you need to remove a lot of the references, the visual references that you would that would give somebody an idea that this was about something. And, and I found I resisted that. Um, so I played with these, but um, 
uh, you know, uh, all of this is really ex exploration. And these last two are, are also part of the texture series where I really tried to build up surface texture and then layer different colors, in some cases, uh, um, pouring in uh, a very diluted acrylic and then moving the panel around so that it would fall into some of the, the crevices um, and in some case wipe off. So it was like, it was fun because I could, it was like anything goes. You know, you paint it on with a brush, put it on with a squeegee, scrape it off with a squeegee, put it on, scrape it off with a palette knife, attack it with a spray bottle. Um, it was like anything that would help me explore and understand better how paint behaves um, was kind of the, my guiding light for the year. And having been an oil painter, but I, I usually paint outside, I, I switched to acrylic so that I would have a, non a less toxic paint to work with in my basement studio, which doesn't have great ventilation. So um, it's, it's kind of like the report you do when you go back to school and says, this is what I did during my summer vacation, only this was what I did during the pandemic. And uh, there's some interesting ideas, particularly in the transparency that I, I'm gonna continue working with. Um, and I, I may also begin trying to work some of them with some oil. Um, because you can get some some interesting effects with oil, but you know, I'll continue to work with acrylic and oil going forward. It's a wonderful body of work, Marguerite. It was fun making it. <laughs> Thank and you. And I hope that shows to people that you know there are these fun little explorations that, um, you know, I think behave nicely in 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 the home because they're they're a scale that's still you know, a very personal scale. Yes, easily accessible. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to visit with Stephanie Rogers. Hello, Stephanie. Hello, Mike and Tina and everyone. And thank you all for being here. And Mike and Tina, thank you for having such a fantastic gallery and allowing me to be a part of it. Um, I relate to what Marguerite said, and I enjoyed seeing your work, Marguerite. Uh, I love paint itself and experimenting and wiping and scratching it off and putting it back on and playing with different types of uh, paint. Um, it gives me a lot of joy and um, I like experimenting as well. Th I would, wouldn't say this work is a series per se. I mean, there are a couple paintings, there are a few paintings in here that aren't, I didn't do this year, I did last year. But I'd say that they all kind of express that feeling of um, joy and freedom and, um, you know, the love of paint um, that I feel when I'm painting. Uh, I'd say they're more the many moods of me than, than a series, but they all generally start with a landscape, uh, except a few in here will be in interiors and then a chairs, um, which for me, represented uh, some people that I lost this year. Um, this is a landscape again with um, lots of movement. I like to have lots of movement in my paintings, almost like dancing colors, I like to think of it. So that you can, there's a lot to see in each little section that'll carry you around the painting is my, my hope. But um, as we go around, let's see. Okay, so these landscapes are a little bit of a darker palette, which um, isn't what I normally do, but I, I enjoy doing um, these darker landscapes and that seascape. So you can see here, there's some palette knife work. There's some scratching off, scratching on. 
Uh, I think I also use some gouache in this. Uh, and I like to layer and wipe and layer and wipe. Um, so. And again, this little painting, more of a little seascape. And here is another landscape with lots of wiping and texture. You can't really see so much. Um, now this is a painting that's called um, Lost Memories or Fading Memories. And I started thinking about a chair inside and then I just kind of wanted to control the paint, but then sort of control and let go and just feel it. And um, so I like to do that. Like I'll control the paint and then I kind of just go with it and just sort of let the paint take me to a place. Stephanie, when you start your work, do you just like start on a blank surface or do you like, how do you approach it? Um, sometimes I do underpainting, but usually I'll work on a, you know, primed canvas and then just um, make a general large gesture on it, on the canvas and then just kind of go from there. So um, more of an intuitive style of painting rather than I don't really approach it with this is what I want it to look like. Um, I just sort of let it happen in a way, but I will, I will make a mark and sit and then I will decide what the next mark will be and the next one, the next one. So while they might look a little more spontaneous, they're really not, <clears throat> excuse me. There's um, a lot of steps to each painting and <clears throat> a lot of, you know, considerations. And you work on them over a period of time. <clears throat> exactly, yeah. Yeah, they're they're never done in one one sitting. Although they look like they just happen, like they <laughs> yeah. are very spontaneous, but that's a it's an illusion. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> So here's more of sort of a, you know, typical landscape, but I was thinking of different seasons happening at the same time. And in the background, that gray sort of figurey um, image was just kind of thinking about someone leaving the earth and sort of, you know, their spirit. And the same with the chair. This is thinking about someone I lost this year. And I just used the chair, but then I just let it happen more of a, I just thought, you know, the people aren't there, but what's left are these beautiful memories and still these feelings of love. And I, that's why I, what I think I captured that in this little painting. And then this is, um, again, it's lots of washes and wiping, <clears throat> excuse me, and this just reminded me of two people having a conversation, so uh, I like working with different colors, color combinations, and seeing how that works. I always feel better when I walk into your gallery. <laughs> always gives me a boost although I know it you know there's there's a range of emotion there but yeah yeah you know it's funny because Bill Scott had said that you know his paintings have so much joy and life in them and you would think he when he was happiest he would paint them but he said that was the opposite that when you know the more he's sort of struggling the happier his paintings are and when I think about that for myself, I, I think that that's kind of true. It's kind of interesting, you know, that um, maybe we paint more uplifting things to bring us up. Maybe we're not necessarily up. <laughs> so, I don't know. 
it's a, but, uh, it's a wonderful body of work, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next, we're going to visit Amanda Mosley. Amanda. Hello, everyone. Uh, so you guys got to meet some of the animal models at the beginning there. Um, you know, I have quite a few creatures living with me, but uh, right now it looks like we're going to start with the cyanotype. So I don't know if anyone is aware of this, but cyanotypes were actually the first blueprint. So you guys hear blueprint, you know, this is actually how architects used to reproduce their plans once upon a time. Uh, the, the process actually combines two chemicals. It goes on, the the coating goes on green, but it washes out blue. Um, it's a little weird to explain, but you're actually putting a positive down. So you want to put something that blocks things out versus a negative, which some of our analog people might remember. But, you know, um, the first person to actually use this process in any sort of meaningful way was actually a woman. It was a female uh, botanist. She used, um, you know, the process to reproduce um, plant um, specimens. And I fell in love with this uh, process when I was in college. Uh, I studied, you know, printmaking and also alternative photo processes. And, you know, it's quick and easy to do. You just have to know how to mix up the chemicals and like you need to have a kind of dark room, but they're just so ethereal and beautiful. Um, you know, and uh, part of the reason why I came back to this process, which I haven't used actually since probably my first year out of art school, is, you know, I was just thinking this year has been so, um, it's just been a loaded year, like all around. And our yard was just full of all these beautiful flowers that we hadn't had the years before. Um, you know, we kind of took over a property that had been ignored for a long time. And I thought, you know, what a wonderful way to uh, just enjoy the, the new light that was coming through. And, you know, these images are made by a marriage between, um, you know, the natural world and also, um, you know, the, the science, you know, science. So, you know, I'm making these with uh, the light of our sun and also the, the plants that grow out in my yard. Um, and you just develop them in regular water. So it kind of merges all these beautiful, uh, you know, uh, elements of our earth. But, um, you know, I, I haven't done this in a long time. I was kind of rusty, but I was excited at the, <laughs> the results because uh, I definitely did throw some stuff out, but I think I got some good images out of the stuff that's on the wall. And yeah, and so I love butterflies. I collect them. Um, I've also painted them in previous shows. And, um, you know, these, this is part of my collection. It was so hard to, like, put these down because you do have to kind of have anything that you're blocking the, um, you know, the mixture with pretty flush to the surface. But I did do this without ruining any of my specimens, which I thought was a big plus. And, you know, we have an incredible array of butterflies that just hang out in our yard. Uh, we live in, you know, a really beautiful place. It's a biodynamic farm, so... You know, people care for the earth here in ways that they probably haven't cared for it in other farms. But, um, and I think next we're going to look at some animals. And, you know, my, my daughter Maisie is with me and she showed you some models. Here's another one. This is uh, the chick that's in that chick painting. <laughs> but, uh, but I, you know, animals... So I have been an animal lover my entire life. You know, my parents uh, were very kind to animals. We grew up being vegetarian, actually. I mean, um, they love you unconditionally. They're our last link to the garden, you know, Garden of Eden. Um, and during COVID, I just thought about how, you know, if I didn't have my pets and my animals, uh, you know, I would just be like so distraught. They really do offer therapy in ways that I think human beings are just not capable of. <laughs> Sometimes I'm offering. One of the animals yeah. in the show. And yeah, my daughter's right next to me. This is Carrot, one of our bunnies. Um, you know, uh, we, we live near a swan pond, and I used to think that swans were the nastiest creatures possible, but I had to save one this past spring because she had kind of wandered out of the you know her yard, and I had to just run and bear it and pick her up and put her back in, but she did not bite me. And this is her and her mate, and we named them Serena and Louie. Uh, 
after um, you know the trumpet of the swan creatures. But um, you know, animals are powerful, and yeah. So these are kind of my favorites because so my daughter um, she has a book called Titus Tidewater, which actually was illustrated by a woman that went to I think either Moore College of Art or Philadelphia College of Art, so University of the Arts now. Um, you know, we love visiting the lobsters at our local grocery store. We also used to go up to Maine, but of course we haven't been able to do that this year. So, um, and we have lots of fish that live with us. So up front is, or up top is Mrs. T, that's our long fin tetra. And down there is um, Bite. And that's one of our many betas. We have uh, quite a few. That um, they well, are beautiful. We don't, have, we don't have the one down low. Yeah, the one down low is still around, just not in the way that I think you're remembering. And so we go to uh, Cape May every year, so w unfortunately it's generally like sea nettle season, but at the same time, like jellyfish are gorgeous. I mean, they move in these really unpredictable, beautiful ways, but they what? do hurt if you step on them. <laughs> every time, a lot, I get stung. I know, you more. get stung. And mommy wants to talk about the fox next. And where we live in Kimberton, we have quite a lot of foxes. And this is the guy that's been hanging out in our backyard. He is huge. We thought he was a coyote, but then we did, you know, actually see him in the, the sunlight. It is a fox, but he's a large male. And he, I mean, all the things that they say about foxes are true. They're very wily, um, you know, very smart. <laughs> he, you know, luckily he hasn't gotten any of our chickens yet, but who knows, we're gonna have to like really pull the coop down. And then, yeah, these are our two reptiles that live with us. Uh, Snakey is on the left in the white frame. You saw him earlier, you know, during the Zoom. Um, you know, like I said, a lot of people hate snakes, but they get a bad reputation. They're just like cats. They don't have legs. And um, and this is our, our basilisk, um, Peridot, who has cost us quite a lot of money and is very bitey, but we love him all the same. And that's the thing with animals is like, they love you, you love them back, they might do things that are just like truly unlovable, but um, they bite you, right? They might bite you, but the rewards of the relationship are, you know, more invaluable than any sort of currency. Amanda, are you using oh. ink and brush for these? Yeah, so, and I should have said at the beginning, so this is all Sumi um, ink. So, uh, in fact, do I have it? Don't have it in front of me, but Essentially, it's like a stick of ink that you grind down. Um, you know, you and Macy, can you get me that black? Yeah, get me that and then get me the black. It looks like this. Um, I have like a piece of charcoal, but you dip it in water, grind it down in various um, dilutions, and you use this sort of tray to do it. So it's hard to tell, but the tray is deeper at one end, more shallow at the other. So you have your darker colors towards the shallow end or darker tones, I should say, like, and then towards the end, which has more water in it, that's where you would have, like, a more diluted tone. Um, you know, just like with watercolors, it's kind of something you have to go over a couple of times. Um, but I've, I've always liked this, this style of painting because, um, you know, I've, I've been a watercolorist pretty much since I was a kid. Uh, and I think that it really gives you really rich um, tonality, like, even more than, like, um, India ink would, and like the subtleties are, are richer than they would be with India ink, but this is a process that I used to use a lot in my earlier years as well, but I kind of came back to this year. So, and you hit them in like one shot, I think, or you're drawing directly with the brush, yeah? You are, yeah, it's a lot like drawing, and I use the traditional brushes that um, Japanese sumi painters use. Uh, can you get me that brush now? Uh, you know, very simple brush, but actually you can use it for many different, um, you know, strokes. So I have two thicknesses. I have like a really thick one for like washes. And then I have a thinner one, you know, more for like the detail. But you just really need like two sizes of brush um, for this particular, um, you know, approach. Unless you want to do it like really, really big, then you need one of like the mop sumi brushes. But well, they look wonderful. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, and you guys did a wonderful job installing everything. I was like so impressed to see the installation photos. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you guys have a good eye. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, next, uh, we will uh, visit Ruth Wolf. Ruth? I'm here. Do you hear me? Yes. Hi there, Mike. Uh, Hi, Ruth. First, I'd like to thank you and Tina for hanging the show. I was able to stop by the gallery this week, and when I walked in, it was like seeing my work for the first time. So thank you very much. You want me to talk about my paintings oh, now? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. This painting is called Outside Looking In, and I wrote a statement about it, a short statement. Uh, have you ever walked by a bright window at night full of people? Someone looks out and for a moment your eyes meet, but it is so bright inside and so dark outside that they cannot see you. So I wrote that after I painted the painting, but I was thinking about looking in through a window as I was developing the painting and this is what came out. So if, if you move on and you, you go to the four paintings, four little paintings on the, in the middle, the, the red one was actually the first color and head study that I had done to develop the bigger painting. And then over a period of time, I just decided to do um, four other paintings that refer to the different kinds of light. So the, the red is dawn, the yellow is noon, I'll, I'll give Tina a chance to, the, um, the blue is dusk and the, the dark one, which is a very dark uh, Prussian blue is night. So that those, those relate to outside looking in. Um, I, uh, I, I put together this show to try to, are you going to that wall next? Can you go around the other way, Tina? Thank you very much. Um, the painting, you wanna go to Whispers? That's the heads. Go, go to the, the, one, the, one, the one painting, Oh, you want to go over there? Those are just, those are three little heads. I like to play with 12 by 12 inch canvases and just do little portraits. I have a, quite a few of them now and I call them invisible people. What's your reference for these, Ruth? Do you have one? Or are you I, I, I catch a image of a person, either an image that I see in the newspaper or an image that I see just in dealing with people or, or a photograph. And I say that that's a portrait I'd like to develop. And the, the people that I choose are not they're just, they're just people like us, ordinary people that live quiet lives and, and have private thoughts and, and don't, they're not in your face people, but I wanna put a face on them. So I call them invisible people, but I hang them up there to make them not invisible. And I, I like to mix media with these and also it gives me a chance to experiment with media that I can do on a small scale rather than on the large canvases. And, and it's fun. It, it, it keeps me from being bored. I don't like being bored. I like to be doing things. So I just keep myself busy and I grab a canvas and paint and, um, where, where are you going to next? You're going to, um, uh, that's Into the Sea of Place and Time. That painting 
took me years to paint. Literally, I would work on it, think that I was resolved and put it over on the side, but it kept itching in my brain and I would take it out and paint it again. And then I think it was resolved and then it would still itch in my brain. And I finally dragged it out. Oh, I don't know, maybe sometime in the fall. And I said, I just, I do not like what's happening here. And I just repainted the whole thing again. And it flipped. It became something that I could live with. And this is, this is the result. Um, I also have used glow in the dark in this painting. And it has two reads depending on the light. Uh, glow in the dark is something that I really like to play with a lot. And I have it, used it in both my larger canvases and also in the smaller canvases. And sometimes I even forget that I've used it until I turn the light off and I find myself being surprised. And th that, that, gives me a giggle so it makes me happy and one of my big issues that I like to address in my painting is how the painting reads in the different light. It, we live in an environment that has ambient light and the light in the morning and the light during the day and the light in the evening and the light at night all give a different read to the paintings. And this is something that I wanna put into the paintings so that when I view them, I can see that they respond to the environment as well as I'm responding to the environment. So does that give the painting a particular kind of life I'll throw that question out there, but I won't answer it. So, um, Tina, can we move on to the dead run at night, which is, th this, this painting here is probably the most successful painting that I've done using the glow in the dark. It has this read in, the daylight and then as the the daylight diminishes there are th three figures in the painting that are running figures that emerge when the light is turned off and the glow in the dark has had is doing its job and it absorbs the ambient light and reflects it back so in order to get an image of that, um, Mike and Tina have put different images on the website that you can click onto and you can see images of the painting in partial light and in the dark where the glow in the dark does its wonderful thing. So that uh, painting is called The Dead Run at Night. Um, it, uh, that, that's it, that's all I have to say about that. Um, if you want to move on to another one, um, we can talk about the drawings, which again is a factor of how, how we can see the artwork or how we can't see the artwork because I made dark drawings when I, I did these drawings, I was really concerned with how charcoal and graphite and alcohol and water and liquefying dry media work on paper. And then I thought about how these things can be viewed in terms of reflection and veiling because the figure Tina is on right now is called Veiled Figure, and I want it to be 
difficult to see. So I put it under glass and it's really difficult to see, but that is part of the meaning of the piece. So I was actually quite happy when I did that. And then I did the angry figure because the veil figure needed a mate. I'll just leave it at that. Um, that's really all I have to say. If you have specific things you want to ask me, that would be good. Okay. All right. Well, thank, thank you, Ruth. It's very powerful stuff. Thank you, Mike. Uh, now, most of you know that uh, Tilda Mann passed away last week, and it's left us heartbroken. But Tilda left us her wonderful work. And that's what we're going to uh, focus on today. And her, Tilda's daughter, Sarah, is here to, uh, to speak about the show. Hello, Sarah. Hi. Um, <clears throat> so I know this was one of the things that my mom was really most looking forward to and, and most focused on um, in this past year. And her art um, has often reflected certain things going on for her. Um, she died of pancreatic cancer and her last show, which was a year and a half ago, um, had a lot of really dark imagery, um, sort of animalistic symbols coming from, I think, a place of just the grueling horrors of chemo. And in this show, she knew it was going to be her last show. Um, and she was much more focused on the ways that we counter all of these difficult things in life. Um, and I, th I know she was thinking about kind of the difficulties of the pandemic that the entire world was facing and, and also her own personal struggle with disease. Um, and she thought about color and beauty and finding beauty in the things that we were able to experience in our own backyard during the pandemic. And I think, um, Stephanie, something you were saying in, in your exhibition about the way that sometimes the more you're struggling, the, the more colorful um, and, and happy a painting can come out. I think that really resonated with me. And I think um, my mom would have been interested in that. I think for her, there was a very purposeful focus on the color and beauty because she felt like that's the way that we counter all of this uh, darkness. That's the way that we keep going. Um, and so I think a lot of this art was about putting one foot in front of the other and really seizing every moment. Um, actually, Tina, could you linger on the iron for a second? So this one, as I was going through a lot of photos in the past um, week, a lot of them were of my mom at different stages in her life and in front of lots of different artworks. And I noticed that there was this painting of an iron she did, I think in the, probably the early 90s. Um, and it was big and dark and had lots of blues and indigos and um, it was kind of this like foreboding thing with this pair of jeans. I was remembering from my childhood, I never even realized it was a pair of jeans. I always thought it was like a person or a monster under the iron. And I was just so struck that this like iron imagery has been with her for so long. Um, but I think that through her life, she, she had so many different relationships with the domestic and her role as um, a mother and a person who cares for a home and also an artist. And I think in this one, I just love the way that the, the iron kind of is happy and it's whimsical and it's on this like bright orange uh, background. And I think it kind of speaks for itself. It doesn't really need the jeans next to it. So I think that, that, that this one captures maybe what I was trying to say about her um, her interest in seeing the beauty around her and feeling at peace with um, the images that she was experiencing this past year. 
Um, let's see. So this one too, with the, the joy of the flowers, she was telling me um, when I was taking some notes on these pieces, this one took her a really long time and she made so many different decisions about how to deal with the furniture in the background. And she felt like it, it ended up looking like a piece that maybe she had had just come together just like that. And one of the things she was really impressing upon me as she was talking through the pieces was that you can kind of never tell what was easy and what was hard. Um, the collage she, I think, was doing from a reference photo. So as she, as she kind of, you know, physically was becoming weaker and weaker, she, she changed the materials she was using um, just to, you know, be able to say what she wanted to say um, in ways that wouldn't necessar necessarily require a lot of brush washing and hauling lots of materials. So doing the collage was something that was easy to clean up and kind of quick, but I think also expressed a lot of that love of color. A lot of the paintings um, use flash, which is um, a medium that can cover a lot of area in these like flat, um, matte, opaque, vibrant tones. So, this one I think has a little flash and some gouache. And she was looking like in exploring the flash and uh, to some degree the gouache, she was looking for materials that would remind her of the tempera paint that she used as a kid. So these two drawings are a kind of a continuation of um, paring down her materials. So these are micron pen and um, some collage. There are pieces of collage paper on there. Um, that was done in her good friend's backyard. And then this one is the micron pen again and flash for that vibrant blue on the floor. She did that in, a, in the studio of another painting friend. This one, um, Garden of Devotions, was another exploration of the flash. The, the cobalt blue um, is all in flash and she was really experimenting with how she might be able to push some of that back. Um, and bring out some of the yellow in the foreground, all while having this like very opaque, intense color. She started with that little vase that you're seeing right now. It was a favorite vase of hers. Um, I know that the dog was inspired by Joan Brown and the baby is uh, my son, Ezra. She did that from a photo that I sent her of him looking at geese, I think. Um, I think she felt that this painting was another one that really encapsulated this idea of um, joy and color and, and kind of bringing lots of references that she loved all together. There's the figure um, next to the vase on the right that I think was supposed to be her or kind of thinking of her. And then again, there's the iron under that. Um, and the plants that reminded her of California. So bringing together lots of things that she was devoted to into this garden. This section um, is more of pieces she made sitting in a friend's garden. And this one, I think she used watercolor and a little gouache. And I think she might have made these two in the same afternoon. They're definitely from the same garden phase house. The hydrangea um, we did together. She that's her version, and I have a version too. She did the 
she set up the uh, the hydrangea and a couple other things in that little blue vase that she's had since I was a kid. She really, really loved this one. And she just said she was so, so pleased with the way the color balance came out. It was really nice for me sitting there when we went over these paintings, we were just sitting on her bed and she said that about a lot of them, just, oh yeah, I really was so happy with this one. I love this one. And I think throughout my life, I've heard her reflections on, um, you know, how she feels about her work. And it hasn't always been um, just so, so loving, I think, toward, toward what she's created. So it's nice seeing these again and, ha you know, having these memories that she felt really pleased, I think, with the voice that she she had on her way out. That one she always referred to as the orange, which I thought was funny because so much of it is not orange. This one is called um, Spring Fling. She started with the that urn in the back, which is a compote vase from her parents. Um, they were Greek. And she started with that and kind of like built the rest around it. She said that one just kind of happened. This one, Lev Luna on the Cusp, was about um, her niece, Lev, um, whom she hadn't seen in a year. She got a picture of Lev and realized, you know, she hadn't seen her from, because of the pandemic. She just all of a sudden looked like a preteen. I think it was at a, somebody's 10th birthday party, and she just was so struck by Lev is on the cusp of adulthood. Um, and so she ended up reworking a completely different painting that was under it. It was almost entirely orange. You can see a tiny bit of the orange poking through in the, the cup on the table. Um, and this ended up being a piece about transitions and people who are there to watch us and guide us through life transitions. She always felt like the, the table was set in this piece and that was she was thinking about how Lev's life, you know, ahead of her is, is like a, the table is set, the foundation is set. This one is the namesake of the show, Let's Love Color. And that was, sorry, the one on the left. That one, um, I think was her first foray into the flash medium. She started with that dark green. And then I believe everything else in the painting is gouache. And that pink vase was a favorite of hers um, that she used in a lot of still life setups. I know she was just thinking about color and space and how to get these new opaque mediums to recede and come into the foreground. This one, I remember her talking about a couple of times and she would just move her hand around in like the, the gesture that she used for that orange flower. She called it a swirl. And this was in oil. So this was one of the earlier ones in this series. And I remember her telling me she, and she said, and the coffee cup, of course, I love coffee cups. This one, Lala's plant, um, she said in real life, the plant that inspired this is actually hanging from the ceiling and she had sketched it and saved the sketch and then later came back to this. And um, I remember her spending a lot of time thinking about that background and dealing with the different yellows. She said her favorite part was the, the painting on the easel because it was this like classical painting. I think she was thinking a lot about how to put art into the art. A lot of these have um, paintings in them somewhere. And I think that was also about kind of the joy of capturing joy in another way. Uh, 
No, and these on black paper are some of the, the most recent. The one on the left is my husband, John, who was working remotely um, from the couch in Cape May Point where we were um, for a couple days in the summer and in September. And she started with the black paper and a white gel pen, just kind of experimenting with contour line drawing. And then she sat down to paint some of it in and got, felt like she had ruined it. And then went back to it a couple of months later, I think. And I think she really worked through some of the stuff that she had been unhappy with and, and ended up resolving it. This one I think was done in a similar fashion with some contour line drawing and, and just some sketching in the white gel pen. And then she went in with the color. This one's called Ingredients. She really, really loved food. And I think that she felt like it was a simple joy and beauty. These are also kitchen ones. So these are in aquarelle. These are, I think, two of the last ones that she did. Um, but just kind of, she knew she didn't have that much time and she just set some stuff up, didn't obsess over the, the setup uh, and just, went with it and did it. And she started signing her stuff at the bottom like that. This one, Roderick's Sri Racha. It's actually my sister's Sri Racha, but um, Roderick, my our brother's partner, um, has been living us with us for the past three months and, and always needs to spice up the food. <laughs> We have had a lot of conversations about how bland our food has, our food has been with her, with her illness, and Roderick would always bring some color into it. This one, Nancy's lunch, was a similar idea. And then this one I think is kind of maybe back to where we started, but this was she. This was one of her earlier ones in the series and she knew that she wanted something that was mostly red. And she said that she had, she felt like she had permission from Matisse and from this greeting card she'd bought herself that she really liked to do something that was so bold and so red. So the red was flash. Um, she started with pencil drawing, so you can still see the, the pencil with the lemons. The squash and gourds are images that she's had over years, maybe even decades of her work. But I think it was kind of interesting to me seeing them in this, um, in this setting. It's definitely the most vibrant squash I've seen from her. Thank you, Sarah. It's a wonderful collection of work. We're honored to, to have it. I know she was really honored to be part of this and I know she would have loved to see the other four artists as well. Well, thank you, Sarah. And thank you to uh, all the artists today. So we're going to uh, conclude the tour and talk and uh, open up our breakout rooms so you can visit with everyone individually. You can feel free to uh, jump back to the main room if you want to visit someone else and we'll, uh, we'll shoot you in there. And uh, thanks again. It's a beautiful set of shows and uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful for us to be able to work with you all and uh, show your work.